Hi all, I have an amazing game to show you from the US Chess Championship in Realm 5 in the Men's US Chess Championship. Daniel Naroditsky, who's 2633, was playing white against the Karu Nakamura 2798. Daniel Naroditsky is only 19 years old, born November 9th, 1995. He was an FM in 2007. And I actually got to play a Blitz game when he was an FM. If you look at Blitz hash 360, if you want to do a search on that, versus Danya, that was when he was an FM. And I won't tell you the result of that. You have to look for yourself. Uh, he was an IM in 2011, and a GM just two years ago, 2013. So another very fast rising player, newly crowned kind of player for GM title. He was, he's from California. In 2007, he won the World Under-12 Championship ahead of Ilya Nezink and picked up his FM title as a result. He won his first IM Norm when he won the first Saturday GM tournament in July 2010. That's usually played in Hungary, the first Saturday GM tournaments. And then he started collecting IM Norms. And uh, at the Berkeley International 2011, he secured his IM title. Uh, he's also the winner of the 2013 US Junior Clothes Championship and has had numerous other achievements. Uh, and it was also a book author. In 2010, he, he published his first book called Mastering Positional Chess. OK, let's get on with this game. E4 from Daniel. Nakamura played the Sicilian defence. After knight f3, d6. We have, after knight f6, knight c3 a crossroads. For black to decide which particular variation of the Sicilian will it be a knight off? Will it be kind of a classical knight c6? But it was actually a Sicilian dragon, highly theoretical. Fisher once condemned this opening and said that you can just basically peel open the h file, sacrifice, and it's all over. Something to that effect. So it's a dangerous opening for the h file, and that might have put off actually many passing Sicilian dragon players. That. Uh, at some point it might have given it up because it's it can be so bloodthirsty that h file for white when white castles queenside uh let's see bishop e3 so white is preparing with this move to castle queenside the standard construction against the sicilian dragon secures against knight g4s helps support queen d2 later exchanging off the bishop and then the dreaded h pawn comes up so that's the basic plan knight c6 Bishop c4, it's useful on this diagonal to sometimes pin this pawn. So that's on this kind of mechanism, this pawn's pinned. Uh, but it's very theoretical. Black castles, we have bishop b3, bishop d7. h4 immediately, slightly more popular it seems is queen d2 here, but h4 immediately. And now h5, this is again, this is a very popular reply just to stop the pawn in its tracks for the moment. Queen d2, and we're in very familiar territory. And the most common move by far here for Sicilian dragon exponents, just to have a quick look at live book, is like this rook c8. Just playing rook c8 here immediately. So something like this could occur with rook c5 now, king b1, b5. There's even over 100 games from here. It's just a very, very topical opening indeed. Uh, here white is supposed to be a little bit better in this variation. So that's the highly topical rook c8 here. Uh, another move is knight e5 or knight a5 with ideas of putting a knight on c4 later potentially. Uh, but Nakamura's move is very rare actually, queen a5. And it, if it's not busted it's interesting uh, in its own right. Apparently Nakamura said he wasn't entirely sure of the exact like theory here. I'm not sure if he was like kidding because this this really could get an opponent off off the tracks. And if if there's no clear refutation of Queen A5, this this is a very interesting uh, new little uh, ingredient to bear in mind. Uh, so White Castle's queenside, there's no immediate way of punishing Queen A5. Uh, knight D5, Black can just take with check, take care. It's very, very comfortable. It's better for black. So there's no, there's no immediate way of punishing uh, queen a5, it seems. Uh, so white castles queenside. We have rook fc8, king b1. 
and this does mean the check is taken out of queen d takes d2 so knight d5 is sometimes more dangerous sometimes but not in this position it seems knight e5 is there's no there's no really dangerous knight d5 just yet we see bishop g5 from white uh, which is actually the most popular move again and now here players with black are usually playing king f8 five games it's in live book with king f8 where it's meant to be slightly better for white for example like this it's meant to be slightly better for white um, this kind of stuff could occur but a very very interesting move uh, is played here in this position from a positional perspective uh, I wonder if you can guess it if I give you five seconds starting from now black to play here so I'm telling you that the um, the most usual move is king f8 so it's not that guess okay an exchange sack rook takes c3 now this is often in a general sense very thematic in the Sicilian dragon but here you probably need some guts to be able to uh, believe in the position with black that black has got enough for this exchange sack uh, of course structurally the pawns are the slowest elements of a chess position here uh, white goes for this position uh, he didn't have better by the way if he'd played um, in instead b takes it doesn't really help to have the queens on here uh, this this kind of thing uh, is okay for black just to torture c3 later uh, so I think I think rook c8 so that was a step up rook c8 looks pretty thematic and and black's got you know a good position good compensation anyway so we have the queens coming off here and is it easy to assess this if white hasn't got any concrete targets uh, in the long term the thing to torture the white position is actually this c3 pawn and to do that if black's given a lot of time uh, it would be nice actually to get this knight involved and there's a very nice knight maneuver if the king's protecting e7 uh, like this in fact where the knight here is is well positioned sometimes to play something like knight a4 if the bishop wasn't there hitting c3 so this kind of long-term knight maneuver getting out of the way of this bishop and trying to target c3 later is perhaps a very interesting long-term positional plan to bear in mind but first a5 provides a concrete threat of a4 uh, embarrassing the bishop bishop doesn't really want to go to d5 so we have a3 and now some focus on c3 immediately rook c3 so the king comes to b2 and now this long-term knight maneuver uh, the prelude being king f8 so this knight e8 to c7 to a6 to c5 um, is some sort of compensation for being the exchange down uh, if black's left to get on with things it's actually a difficult position to try and crack here white now played knight e2 uh, and there's a kind of weakness of the last move knight e2 you could say that it's not controlling the b5 square and in fact Nakamura just goes with bishop b5 here and white decides there's nothing better than going back to d4 it's a funny little episode this of the game but it seems only to have helped black a little bit the bishop now goes to a6 it's actually a, been improved from where it was it's it's an interesting diagonal um and yeah a little bit of a waste of time you might ask uh if you know knight f4 then actually knight h7 and the bishop's a victim here it can't go backwards uh so this is fairly pleasant for black uh to be able to take on on g5 as an option so the knight just goes back to d4 we have a bit of wasted time then rook h e1 and now knight f d7 this is another way of torturing c5 potentially uh just just sorry c3 just going knight c5 at some point or even you know consider this to, to these sensitive squares that c4 square in fact here after f4 now white's trying to play for e5 which you might think is quite logical because the looks the rooks look quite harmonious as though e5 should be useful for white but here it is blocking in the bishop for a moment and you'll see in this position now 
that once the knight gets out of the way, black is actually, I know it's check here, black is actually threatening f6. Uh, so to trap the bishop, that would actually be trapping uh, that bishop on g5. So white feels compelled now to take on c4 because he's actually got to do something about this f6. Uh, so bishop takes c4. Getting the bishop pair now is also very interesting. But you'll note that that previous long-winded knight maneuver has actually been sped up here. And in fact, there's nothing holding the a4 square. There's no bishop protecting a4 now. So if this knight gets to a4 and then c3 drops, uh, then these pawns are isolated. And this bishop is also improving with the dropping of c3 while it'll be less solid in the center. So this position represents an improvement now only for black with the bishop pair and with a4 slightly weaker for knight c5 to a4. But immediately black is threatening f6. So white does something to give his bishop reverse gear. But now knight c5 is very, very powerful for knight a4. We have rook e3 trying to defend that c3 point. And now the black king goes towards the center a bit more, king e8. Uh, without fear because you know white's committed this f5 there's no real e5 break the thematic breaks for white uh, don't seem to be here whilst black seems to having be having a great time with all his pieces here the exchange down it's a remarkable position and if anyone was checking this game with an engine they'd think what on earth is going on there or even from the opening book perspective uh you know the whole idea of queen a5 and the quick exchange sack has very rarely rarely been played before but Nakamura is showing already at this point, black is seems to be totally okay. Um, white doesn't seem to have done anything drastically uh, that wrong, uh, but finds himself in a difficult position to play. Uh, so it's quite remarkable from two perspectives, opening theory and the, the technicalities of the exchange sacrifice. But in the long term, if black's got the maneuvers to torture C3, then a lot is going on for, for, for black's position in terms of prospects. Uh, we hit, we see here knight a4 check, king c1. And now this c3 is really looked at hard with bishop a6, threatening now knight takes c3 supported by the rook. This is a really difficult position. If white tries, uh, say, king d2, he actually played e5 here. If he played king d2, this is drastically punished with knight b2 hitting the rook and threatening knight c4. And that will be having a fantastic time with knight c4 check. Doesn't even have to take this rook. Could go here for the other rook and black will be doing fantastically there. Okay, so yeah, this is real torture on c3 all of a sudden. Uh, white tries e5 to try and make use of his rooks like this. It seems a logical thing to do. But um, now d takes e5 is played. And it's just very, very unfortunate that the king is on c1 because here white is forced to give up the exchange. If he plays bishop takes e5, can you see what black has in this position, which is crushing? If I give you five seconds starting from now. Okay, kind of weakness to the last move. It's not controlling h6. So we play bishop h6. Sometimes chess is funny like that. You just look at the last move. And there's an opportunity there created from the very last move. Bishop h6 pinning the rook. Very useful and crushing. Black wouldn't even have to give an exchange here. Could play rook takes c3. Torture the pin first. Celebrate the pin. This is really crushing. g7 is in fact a fancy variation. Rook takes e1 is to double check and mate. Very nice. So yeah, can't allow bishop h6. Horrible things would happen. So rook takes e5. So black's doing perfectly well here. He's got his exchange back. Okay, he's lost his bishop there, but he's now winning c3, which was the long-term plan to generate prospects for the exchange sack. He's hitting the rook, rook e1. And now just winning more material here. Black plays g takes f5. This is not a very nice position at all for white. Uh, the pieces look a little bit on the loose side. There's horrible things like knight e2 check on the cards. Uh, white decides here to play bishop f6. Now on the surface of things here, 
uh, you might think e6 is tempting, but I think then white might have some resources like uh, potentially knight takes f5, it will trek threatening knight d6. So he could sack the exchange and play knight d6 after that sort of thing. But no, Nakamura plays knight e4 with the idea of knight takes f6. And maybe, you know, white calculated this that this would be okay, a very dynamic play potentially with knight takes f5 in return hitting e4. So if knight takes f6, there's a little clever resource for white, it seems. If Nakamura played knight takes f6 here, uh, which would be knight takes e7 hitting the rook, followed by knight d5 check with this, this guy in mind. Uh, so say rook c4, knight d5 check, and you know white's still in the game a little bit, a little bit, but black's, black's actually a little bit better here as well, pawn up. But uh, no, Nakamura doesn't have to do this at all after knight takes f5. He actually can protect the knight tactically. Uh, can you guess what does black play here? I'll give you five seconds. Okay, bishop d3 and attacking and defending at the same time. So now we have a concession c3 which weakens this diagonal. And this is actually significant. Not only is the weakened diagonal the king's a bit shaky, there's a loose piece here. Of course, there's a loose piece. All, all three of white's pieces are loose. But there's one in particular, particular which can work well with this weakness of b1, because the knight's holding d2. So the king actually hasn't got that many squares. Nakamura plays an absolutely crunching move here, tactically, a crushing move, should we say. If he plays something like um you know this then there's that pin there's knight d6 check at least i have to try and pick back the piece no there's something so much stronger than any of that in this position after c3 what does black play here if i give you five seconds starting from now okay rook c5 it hits the knight and it also kind of it's it's uh, trying to get quickly to, to cooperate with the bishop on b1 for rook b1 to be checkmate. So white is actually losing material here, it's pretty horrible. Uh, he actually plays knight takes e7 and now just rook b5. Unless white wants to stave off the mate by giving up the exchange, uh, he could try and play on with rook takes e4 but against Nakamura it's a bit futile because it's like the exchange down. He actually resigned here if rook takes e4, this just doesn't look very good, the exchange down, to say the least. In fact, this knight's a little bit stranded at the moment as well, and these pawns are probably going to drop off at the very least. So, yeah, in this position after rook b5, white had enough, he resigned. I think this game's very interesting from the sacrifice of the exchange. Sometimes we justify an exchange sack by saying, well, it's one or two pawns for the exchange, but here it wasn't even any pawns. For the, for the positional exchange sack. And yet, it seemed very interesting for black. Just the prospect of winning a single pawn that c3, which is a critical pawn, uh, seems to give black a very lively position full of prospects. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.